Welcome to Fresh Encounter. Let's stand together for our Bible study. And we're going to be having uh, various themes on Wednesday night. And this is a great crowd as we begin. We have right at 85 people in our uh, core class tonight, new Christians and folks that Brother First is teaching. Our single adults, uh, Lancaster Baptist uh, single adults and town, town and single adults are meeting still on Wednesday night. And so they're in their classes. And, and then the teens and others are spread all around. But this is a great start. And thank you for being here. And we're going to be focusing on prayer the next three or four Wednesday nights and uh, just uh, really wanting to have God's power and uh, growing in personal prayer. We're going to have some prayer time tonight in the encounter portion of this service as we encounter God through prayer. Uh, And uh, we'll have a wonderful time these next 12 weeks. And I'll be uh, doing some teaching, some of our pastoral staff with us, and then a few guests that are going to be coming along as well. And I hope that this will be a great time for all of us. Tonight, uh, in Psalm uh, 81, we're going to look at one verse, and t- tonight's Bible study will be a little more topical in nature on the subject of prayer, and uh, we're not uh, focusing on a pattern for prayer as much as the preparation for prayer. How do we get our hearts ready uh, to approach the throne of God? But I want you to see with me in Psalm 81, and beginning in verse uh, number 10, just this one verse, uh, we'll read actually, let's, let's actually read verses 8, 9, and 10, and then I'll pray, and you should have received some study notes as well, and so I hope that will be a help to you tonight. Psalm 81, 8, hear, O my people, and I will testify unto thee, O Israel, if thou wilt hearken unto me, there shall no strange God be in thee, neither shall thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Let's read verse 10 together. Ready? Begin. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we're back together uh, in the midweek, and we just pray that you would bless this time. Thank you for the refreshing uh, music and the refreshing testimony from overseas. We do pray for the conference there right now in Sri Lanka. We thank you that several West Coast Baptist college graduates are there and other missionaries from other backgrounds that we support. And, And they're praying for the 1040 window and for revival. And we join them in that prayer tonight. And Lord, we're praying for revival here in America. And we know that uh, when we plan and when we work, uh, some things may happen. But when we pray, great things happen. And so teach us tonight and strengthen our prayer lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, Dr. John R. Rice often said, all of our failures are prayer failures. All of our failures are our prayer failures. How many of you are like me when something doesn't go well, when something is not uh, seemingly having the anointing and the blessing of God? uh, One of the things that I step back and ask myself is, did I really pray about this the way I should have? And sometimes uh, we kind of tag prayer in at the end, but we don't bathe things in prayer along the way. Well, tonight we're going to see a promise from God in this time together, a promise which simply says, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. This speaks of God's desiring for each of us to have an expectation for God's desire to bless us greatly. And uh, he says, he does not say open your mouth a little, he says open your mouth wide. And if God would promise to his people nearly 3,000 years ago that he would fill their expectation, that he would bless their prayer life. I believe that's his desire for us in 2022 as well. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 24 and verse number 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And these words concerning prayer are as relevant and pertinent for us tonight as they were when the psalmist penned them many years ago. God, our heavenly Father, delights to hear from us, and he delights in answering prayer. We've seen God answer prayer. I look around this room tonight, and I can see dozens and dozens of illustrations in this room tonight of people with situations where we have prayed and we have seen God intervene. Our Heavenly Father wants to hear from us. Psalm 34 and verse 6 says it this way, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him 
out of all his troubles. And I'm here to say tonight, by way of introduction, the same God who heard Hannah, the same God who heard Noah, is the God that hears us when we pray tonight. How many of you are thankful for that? He is in tune to our needs. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In other words, Jesus understands the trials and the tribulations that we experience. And this is why when the Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace, uh, we praise him that he invites us to come and bring our need to him. And so tonight we're going to speak about preparing our heart for victory. We're going to speak about praying for victory. There are many areas where we need God's victory tonight. We need God's victory in our family. I often wonder, how can someone raise a family in 2022 without the help of God? It just cannot be done. We need to pray for our families. We need to pray for our country tonight. We have never seen America so divided, so filled with hate, so filled with sin. We need to pray for our country. We need to pray for our church tonight. We need to pray that God will help us as we enter this fall season, that he will give us a great revival, a great a stirring, a great moving for the souls of men. And so I want to ask you as we begin tonight, in what areas of your life do you need victory tonight? Where would you say, if you were to write down on your notes tonight something that you need victory in, what would that be? Someone might say, well, I need victory over sin, or I need victory to have a more powerful witness, or I need victory over someone that's vindictive to me uh, at work. But I'm telling you, all of us tonight have a struggle in which only God can bring the victory. All of us need to learn how to open our mouth wide and seek God in these times and seek his help for our family, for our lives. And so tonight, I'd like to give you some help to find victory in your prayers. I want you to notice, first of all, that we must prepare our hearts for prayer. We must prepare our hearts for prayer. Now, this Sunday night, we have the Lord's table, and what a wonderful time the Lord's table is to examine our hearts, but I believe God wants us to be daily examining our hearts in the light of Scripture. He wants us to be ready to talk to Him. He wants us to be on praying ground. Now, I want you to notice scripturally tonight that we must not tolerate sin in our hearts. We must not tolerate sin in our hearts. As we go to the Lord in prayer... One of the very first components of our prayer, uh, aside perhaps from adoring God and greeting God, is to be honest with God and to confess to the Lord areas that we know have not been pleasing to him. Psalm 66, 18 is a very convicting verse, and it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, sometimes people say the Bible is so hard to understand. How many of you would say that verse is fairly clearly given to us? Let's read it together, shall we? If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And, and so it is, it is a truth that if we come to the Lord in prayer and there's bitterness or there's some type of marital conflict or there's some uh, action that's taken place that's grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, then we must not tolerate that in our hearts as we come to the Lord. He wants us to come with a clean heart, with a pure heart before him. Isaiah 59 says it this way, uh, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Now, the Bible does not say there in Isaiah that they were no longer God's people. The Bible does not say that when we sin, we are no longer God's people. How many of you are thankful we're kept in the hand of the Almighty God? I, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Thank God for the doctrine of eternal security. But sin always hinders fellowship, always. When a husband and wife are fighting with one another, when there have been words that are unkind. It's very difficult, uh, apart from an apology, to just act like that's not going on. In fact, many times you don't even really want to communicate. And one of the greatest reasons for prayerlessness is the presence of sin that is unconfessed. Because we know, we know 
as we're holding on to our sin, it's very difficult to come to God and act like that's not present in our life. And so the Bible tells, tells us in Isaiah 59 that the sins of the people of God had caused uh, them to have this lack of fellowship. We must not tolerate sin in our hearts. Now, a moment ago I asked you, what is it that you need victory with tonight? What area do you need prayers answered tonight? And let's weigh this out. Do we need victory more than we want to hold on to this sin? I believe tonight all of us should be willing to lay anything down on the altar that would hinder our prayer life. And notice, secondly, we must confess that sin. We must confess all known sin. Now, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God is ready and willing to restore fellowship. He's already paid the price for forgiveness. Uh, This confession is not because he doesn't know about the sin. It's because he wants us to come to him with a heart that is true, whether it's been covetousness or anger or bitterness, something that we must bring to him. And one of the ways that we can prepare our hearts in prayer, one of the ways that we can show sincerity to God in prayer about a matter is through fasting, is through coming to the Lord with confession and with fasting for a period. It may be one meal. It may be a day of meals, sometimes longer than that. Notice in your notes, Mark 9, 28, and when he was come into the, ho- into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out, speaking of devils, a, a demon? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Remember I said, what is it you need victory with tonight? And Jesus says there are some kinds of things that you're going to have to be so serious about that yes, you're confessing sin, you're laying sin down, and you're fasting. You're saying, Lord, I want to bring my prayer here to its fullest development. I'm going to lay aside the pleasures of this world including even food. How many of you are like me? You enjoy a good double-double now and then. Can I get an amen on that? Some of you just woke right up. The fact of the matter is that when you want something so desperately, when you need God to touch someone in your family with healing or restoration, when your heart is broken over something that uh, is happening, you're going to be willing to set aside the trivial things of this world, and sometimes even food, in order to seek God's face. Acts 14, 23 says, and when they had ordained them elders in every city uh, and in every church, they had prayed with fasting. They commended them to the Lord on whom they believe. I know that right now in Sri Lanka, they're having this prayer conference, and they're praying, and they've been doing some fasting, and they're in the midst of a country gripped by Buddhism. And they know there's no way that they can go out and see souls saved without God's intervention. And so prayer and fasting, we must prepare our hearts. Secondly, we must prepare our lives. Uh, Our heart is always going to be attached to our actions. And so as God deals with our heart, there's going to be certain actions and certain activities that will change as well. Now, these really are conditions for prayer. And I want you to think of them as I give you four or five. Here are some of the conditions with which we must be prepared. I want you to see, first of all, God is calling us tonight to be a people with sanctified lives. Sanctified lives. God says, I want you in your prayers to be a person that's set apart unto me. I want your whole attention. James 5, 16 says, uh, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So confession is linked to effectual prayer. God says, I want you uh, to come to me with fervent, effectual prayer. 1 Peter 3, 12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil. There's only one prayer that God wants to hear if we've been living an evil life. That's the prayer of repentance. That's the prayer of saying, Lord, I've been wrong. I want you to forgive me. I want to come back to you in in the position of a sanctified Christian life. Now, you say, am I not sanctified when I got saved? Yes, you are. You're set apart by the Holy Spirit. 
But there is such a thing as progressive sanctification, that is, growing in the likeness of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29 says that we're to be conformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're sanctified, set apart into his likeness. Not only does God want us to have a life that is set apart or sanctified, secondly, he wants us to be living an obedient life, an obedient life. How many of you, if you tell your child to make their bed and they don't, you tell them to take out the trash and they don't, they, you tell them to do their homework and they don't, you tell them to stop fighting with their sister and they don't, and then they come and say, Daddy, Daddy, can I have $5 for the store today? How many of you are uh, disinclined to give $5 to a continuously disobedient child? How many of you would understand what I'm saying there? And, and God is saying to us that he's looking for us to live with a heart of obedience toward him. 1 John 3, 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Now, that is not to say that if you're a really good person, God's going to give you everything you want. It's just to say that as we look at the conditions of prayer, one of those conditions is that we're walking obediently with the Lord, that we're doing what we know we're supposed to be doing. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. To whom much is given, much is required. God says, I want you as you come to me uh, and as you ask for me, you're going to receive from me as you're obeying my commandments and doing those things that are pleasing in his sight. And so these are the conditions that God gives to us. I want you to live a sanctified life. I, I want your heart, your whole heart. I want you to be living an obedient life. Uh, we know there are certain things God's called us to do from the standpoint of our walk with him. Uh, we know that he's called us to assemble together. We know that he's called us uh, to bear fruit. We know that he's called us uh, to live uh, righteously. And yet, if we neglect these things that we know, uh, we are only kidding ourselves when it's time to seek God in prayer. And how many of you know that in a moment's notice, you may need God uh, and his help. It may be an ER room. It may be any one of a number of witnessing opportunities. Uh, we want to be on praying ground as the day begins and throughout the day as well. So there must be a sanctified life, an obedient life. Thirdly, there should be an abiding life. If you want God to abide with you in prayer, then we must abide with him. John 15, 7, if ye abide in me and that my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Now these are all biblical conditions for a faithful prayer life. God says, I want you to have a sanctified life. He says, the faith, my face is, is uh, not toward those that do evil. You need to set yourself apart unto me in this life of prayer. He says, I want you to have an obedient life, keep keeping my commandments, uh, and uh, you will receive those things uh, that you ask for. I want you to have an abiding prayer life, uh, and you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done. And then let me say fourthly, letter D here, if you are serious about your prayers, you need to have a harmonious marital relationship. A harmonious marital relationship. Now, God speaks in, in some general terms when he says, keep my commandments. Uh, God speaks uh, perhaps somewhat generally when he says, my face is against those that do evil. And, and, uh, and these, are, these are broad statements. But then he narrows it down in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, which says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, your wives, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of God. Why? That your what? Prayers be not hindered. Now, I believe there is certainly an application if you're not married. I think you could honestly uh, come to a place of understanding that if, if you're living with animosity towards any family member or any brother or sister in Christ, uh, then that would fall under the realm of evil. That would fall under the realm of holding sin and iniquity in your heart. But how much more so when you are married and you have made a vow to love, honor, and cherish, and God commands you to love your wife even as Christ loved the church, and you are treating your spouse worse than you treat people you work with or commute with, and God says that you need to dwell with knowledge and you need to give honor to your spouse that your prayers be not hindered. And, and husbands and wives, those of you who've been married a while, you know that just in a moment's notice, you could get that phone call. Just in a moment's notice, you need to pray for your children. You need to pray for some circumstance, and you want to be on praying ground 
in those times. And so God desires that we would treat our spouses with that love uh, and respect uh, that he desires and has told us to give to one another. So we must prepare our hearts as we come to the Lord in prayer. We can't be holding sin and regarding iniquity. We must prepare our lives uh, in a sanctified and obedient fashion, uh, an abiding life with him and in our marriage as well. Then notice thirdly, we must prepare in faith. We must prepare in faith. Now, the first part of this message really deals with our heart and our actions and really just being honest with God when we come to pray Uh, and just really saying, Lord, if there's any, show me if there's anything in my heart that's not pleasing to you, show it to me because I really need victory. I need victory in this area or that area. And God says, I want you to come to me with sincerity and in truth. But now besides that sincerity and the obedient life, the submissive life, we're going to see that God wants us to come to him with faith believing. Remember our text tonight, open thy mouth, what? Wide. And this really speaks to the faith of the Christian. Uh, I want you to expect that I'm going to pour out some blessings. Uh, I'm, I want you to expect that I'm going to bless you and provide your need. I remember when our children were all born and began to uh, first uh, take some little food out of the baby jars. And, and of course, I used to test some of that food. And, and, and some of it was just absolutely gross. I mean, I, I, I always would think to myself, why would a kid eat these whirled up peas like this? They just tasted terrible. But the applesauce I liked. And so normally, like with Larry, it was one for you, one for me, you know, something like that, you know, and uh, uh, for, the, for the food that I thought tasted good. But when those children figured out something that they thought tasted good, I would, I, a lot of times I'd do the airplane trick, you know, and I'd bring it in. But I'm telling you, Larry and, and, and the kids, they'd open their mouth as wide as they could and literally shake. <laughs> and, and, and they just, they would shake like that. They wanted that food to come into their mouth and they, they just couldn't wait till it came in. And God says, hey, I want you to open your mouth wide and I want you to expect. And though, though I tease a little bit about taking a little bit of the food or maybe playing some games with it, it was so much fun for me as a dad to watch that food go in and see the kids get so excited about eating that. And I'm telling you that our heavenly father wants to fill you up with his blessings. That's the father that he is. He is the father that gives every good gift. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above, from the father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He wants to bless you tonight. And he's going to do that through faith. Faith invites possibility. The Bible says in Mark 9, 23, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Now, we've seen God do some great things. I tell you, I walked through that children's building today, and I just get so blessed. It has these areas upstairs that I kind of call them quad areas. They're, they're areas where you have two classroom doors on this side, two classroom doors on this side, and the architecture is such that it gives good room for dropping off and fellowshipping with the parents. And I was looking at all the electrical outlets for the check-in systems for the building and, and uh, the big room for the slide and just all of the different uh, features of that building, just so amazing. And I just thank the Lord. I said, Lord, thank you for people that have had faith through the years to see these things done so that others might hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and be saved. I was talking today to our Spanish pastor, Brother Collins, and he's a dear man. Many of you know his wife went home to be with the Lord about a year ago with COVID, and he's been so faithful preaching. And, and he preached Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday down at the Los Angeles Baptist Church, a church that we started 20 years ago. And I was thinking about that and uh, about the college students, in fact, that, that uh, when I made an announcement in chapel, several of them said, we'll go down there and do some door knocking. And just by faith, some college students went down and started knocking on doors in a neighborhood leading people to Christ, keeping their names and their addresses and phone numbers. And, and uh, soon, one of our men, God called him to pastor and to preach, Brother Sal uh, Minivar. And Brother Minivar has been there 20 years now, has met in schools and rented buildings, this building and that building. And God's let them purchase an old Pentecostal building. And, and uh, on one corner of this property, you look out and you see a, a mosque, just a big, huge mosque. And they're always ah, going on and doing their prayers and all that. On the other, on the other corner, is a big marijuana dispensary. 
And all around is just kind of crime. And, and yet in the middle of that environment, every Sunday of the world, souls are being saved. Why? Because of some young people that believed God. Why? Because of a man that had faith to trust God and to sell a wonderfully lucrative business and to go to a place, by the way, he lives just a few blocks from the church, and he's happy and he's thrilled to be in the middle of the will of God. I remember preaching at a, at a particular service, and uh, we gave the altar call, and afterwards, a young man from the college came up to me, and, and his name was William Miracle, and he said, Pastor, he said, God has called me to China. And I remember thinking to myself, well, uh, I'm, I'm glad you have a tender heart, but nobody goes to China. And so uh, I didn't say it exactly like that, but I said something like, well, keep praying. And I said, maybe, maybe Taiwan. And I kind of threw out some other Chinese speaking opportunities. And he said, God wants me to go to China. And he said, and I, and he said, I, I want to go. And he said, I just, I want to be like George Mueller. He said, I don't want to go around to churches asking for money. I'm just going to trust God that he'll provide. And when he said that, I thought, now that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in all my entire life. And I'm just being honest with you, William was expressing great faith. And I, I want you to know, I didn't have as much faith as William. But did you know that William Miracle somehow was able to get a visa, somehow was able to get to China, somehow got involved teaching over there, uh, and, uh, and through all of that got a little bit of income, and the Lord allowed him to start two or three churches. He has sent students here to West Coast from those churches in China, and God used him to do a great, great work for the glory of God. He's pastoring north of San Francisco Bay Area now, and God's using him in a wonderful way there. But how did that all happen? Why are those churches, by the way, still going, and they have trained pastors that Brother Miracle planted, uh, trained as he planted those churches? It was all because of someone that just believed God. I remember the first time I prepared a budget and presented it to the church. The budget was $129,000. And uh, that was the budget I prepared in our first annual meeting. Our offerings about that time were about $800 a week. You do the math. Uh, we had about $40,000 of income, and we're propo proposing a budget. And I, I, I didn't really know everything. I just tried to figure out stuff I thought the church would need. And I just stood up in faith. And, and I was kind of nervous about presenting it and, and hoping that all the numbers were right. I'll never forget a man. He raised his hand. I said, anybody have a question? And, and he raised his hand. And I thought, oh, Lord, don't let this be too tough. I'm not an accountant. Here's his question. He said, this is a lot of money. He said, where's that money going to come from if we're going to support these missionaries and paint these buildings and do these tracks and all these things in the budget? And Brother Downey, you may have been there. He said, where's all the money going to come from? I said, well, it's going to come from the Lord as all of us tithe. And he said, okay. <laughs> and you know what? I thank the Lord that that group of 30 or 40 people had faith in the Lord and in a young pastor to say, you know what? If we all pray and give, God will provide the need. And God has blessed this at Lancaster Baptist Church. All things are possible to them that believe. Faith invites God's power, wisdom, and blessing. Faith invites possibilities that we sometimes think are not possible. I think about the fall season coming up. It's going to be more than just decorating the auditorium and put some pumpkins around. We're going to need God's power. And as we stand to preach the word of God, we're going to need to see people's hearts touched. And you are going to need God's power as you witness in your neighborhood and on your commuter bus. And, and, and we're going to need to see God do something great. But we've got to believe that he can and that he will. He's looking for people that will believe. Faith invites possibility. Secondly, faith pleases God. Let's never forget this. Faith pleases God. Without faith, as we've often quoted, it is impossible to please him. I thank God for young people here at West Coast Baptist College. They came here by faith. They just trust in God. Uh, and, and I'm proud of that and thankful for that. But God is pleased with it. Notice what it says in Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. And God is looking for us to knock, and to knock, and to seek, and to seek, and to have faith and trust in him every step of the way. Prayer. We must prepare our hearts. We cannot harbor iniquity in our hearts. 
we must be sincere. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, We must prepare our lives. Lord, what is it in my hand? What is it in my life that you want me to forsake? Is it food? Do you want me to pray with fasting? Whatever it is, Lord, I want my life to reflect in the abiding relationship that we have. I want my life to reflect my heart for you. And then we must prepare in faith. And then finally, I want you to note these things. We must be prepared in our motives. Make sure as you pray that you're praying with biblical motives. Well, what are biblical motives? How do we know what those are? Well, first of all, they're going to be pure motives. And what do we mean by that? James 4, 3 says it this way. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Someone says, I prayed for six years for a powerboat and God never answered my prayer. No, God answered your prayer. He knew what you needed more than you knew what you needed. God says, look, if you're just praying for something that's of the, 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 the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, I'm not going to answer that. How many of you know that some of the best answered prayer you ever had was when God didn't answer your prayer? God says, I want you to have the right motives. Remember what it says in Matthew 6 when you study the model prayer, the Lord's prayer. He says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. When you study prayer, you begin to realize, you know, God's looking for a relationship with me. He's looking for abiding with me. He doesn't want me walking in sin uh, and asking him for help. God wants me to come to him in faith. And God wants us to pray according to his will. Now, we can ask God for all kinds of different things, but as we've been seeing in the life of Esther, God is always planning out and executing a sovereign will and a plan for our lives. And we want to be in sync with that. And so have a pure motive. And and letter B, you want to have a patterned motive, a pattern motive. What do we want to pattern our motives after in prayer? We want to pattern our motives after God's will. God's will. Now look at 1 John 5. And we saw this recently, 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. God says, I want you to pray and I want you to remember that if you ask something according to my will, And always remember this. We can't force our will on God. God has a divine will. But we can pray, Lord, I'm asking in faith. I believe my heart is right toward you. And Lord, if it would be your will, I want to ask for victory in this area. I want to ask for blessing in this area. And there are certain things we know are God's will. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants people to get saved. You you can't go wrong praying for somebody to get saved. He wants us to be faithful And certainly we need to have victory in these areas. And so we can pray according to his revealed will. There may be some things that are not God's will. I remember years ago when we would take drives out to Colorado to see my grandparents and we'd get into Cortez, Colorado. And normally we always would go go to one of the true value hardware stores. And uh, we'd go into either a hunting store or we'd go to a little store there called uh, True Value Hardware Store and it's called Slavens and and when the boys were really young, maybe, maybe just, uh, I don't know, six and four or something like that, uh, we'd go into that hardware store and they always wanted a pocket knife. They always wanted, they didn't want a pocket knife. They wanted a bigger knife normally is what they wanted. And, uh, and, and oh, they would ask with such importunity. They didn't fast or anything, but they really asked a lot. And uh, they seemed to have quite a little bit of faith. They wanted, they wanted a knife so bad. And, uh, and when they were at that age, I just always said, no, no, we're not going to get a knife. Uh, just like my dad always said no when I wanted a motorcycle. How many know what I'm talking about? And I, I wouldn't let them have that. I wouldn't let them have those knives. And uh, oh, they kind of kind of cry. And then later on, they got to be older, like 28 or so. I got them a knife, I think, about that age. But it's kind of funny because I was back there a few years ago with my two grandsons, Camden and Chandler. They were about the same age as Matt and, and Larry when I used to say no to them. We got in that store. They saw those pocket knives. Oh, Papa, can we have a pocket knife? We want a pocket knife. Sure, no problem. And not a problem at all. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just uh, they had more faith than Larry and Matt. That's, that's all I can say. But God says, I want you to pray according to my will. Lord, if it be thy will. Now, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. I wish we had time tonight to think of all of the great men and women 
who have lived this out as a reality in their life. I think of William Carey. Several years ago, I was in, uh, in England, Terry and I and some other folks, and we went over to Oxford University, and one of the 30 or so universities there is Regent's Park University. It has a Baptist uh, connotation and attachment. And uh, in the basement of their library, they have a lot of the prayer letters of the early Baptist missionaries and a lot of the sermon notes of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I had called ahead, and they had laid a lot of these things out. They said, do you have anything in particular you'd like to see? I said, I'd like to see anything to do with, uh, I'd like to see anything to do with Charles Haddon Spurgeon or anything to do with William Carey. William Carey is called the father of modern day missions. And they laid out a lot of his prayer letters and some teacups and for some reason a lock of his hair. Uh, unfortunately, it's too late for me to donate that to our library here at West Coast, but somehow they'd gotten a lock of his hair and everything. And... Um, and we began to relive a little bit of William Carey's life. He was from Olney, England, a little village in England. He really felt God wanted him to be a missionary uh, to India. He felt the Lord leading him to do this. And uh, his pastor said, well, I'll let you bring a sermon to the church. And I've been to the church, just a little church on the city square. And he said, I'll let you, I'll let you bring the sermon and you can share your burden. And William Carey, he stood up and he was so nervous, he could hardly speak about going to India. He couldn't really get the verses out. And, uh, and, and it was so bad, and I've read this in several accounts, that the people of the church said to him, please don't ever preach again. Please don't. By the way, don't ever say that to a young preacher. Find something good like, you know, John 3.16, that was a good text. If that's all that you can find out of it, try to encourage him. William Carey was so discouraged. His pastor, his pastor said, William, I know God's burdened your heart for this. I'm going to help you. And his pastor began to work with him, and, and he began to develop a biblical message about missions. At the close of the message, he gave an illustration, often with his tongue stammering. And the illustration was simply this. He said, I'm willing to go down into India. I'll go down in the basket if you'll hold the ropes. If you'll hold the ropes. That was his way of asking for support. Well, he went to India, and for many years, he didn't see anyone saved at all. In fact, he had a teenage son that rebelled against the faith. In fact, he had problem after problem. In fact, I read some of the letters in the library there at Regents College. Many letters said this, I regret to report to the Mission Society that not one heathen was converted this month. Now, I'm sure that many people would have looked at William Carey and thought, what a loser. What a loser. But what people didn't know was that back home in England, William Carey had a sister. Her name was Polly. Polly was a paraplegic. She was bedridden for 52 years. But Polly was a prayer warrior. And as William Carey would write these letters to his mission board, he also would write these letters to Polly. And Polly would lay in that bed and she would pray, God, keep William safe. God, give William souls. God, help William to lead people to the Lord in India. And sure enough, after several years, the first souls were saved and more souls were saved and more souls were saved. William Carey would write about translating the scriptures into many dialects in India he translated the scriptures during his lifetime into 25 different dialects in India. He was able to plant and to start dozens and dozens of churches. He was able to start a college that still exists to this day called Serampore College. William Carey, when he came back to the States and gave his testimony, he said, none of these great works would have ever been done were it not for the prayers of Polly, my sister a woman that was right with God, a woman that wasn't harboring iniquity, a woman that abided with the Lord and prayed that his will would be done and prayed for great works to be done. I wonder what God wants to do in this church. I wonder what areas he wants us to open our mouth wide and expect. Is it the missions conference this year? Is it the soul winning outreach? What does God want to do and yet we've not opened our mouth wide so that he could fill it? 
Sometimes we might look at a ministry or a minister and we might say, wow, look at what God's done for them. And I'm convinced in my life personally that so many of the blessings that God has brought are because of a mother who prayed and a grandmother who prayed and members who have prayed. We have not because we ask not. I want to encourage you tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer tonight that you would think about that area where you need victory, whether it's with your health, your family, something else. And as the men come to pray tonight, and we'll be praying in different formats and different ways during these Fresh Encounter services, that you'll bring your request to the Lord and that you'll ask God to really work on your behalf in that area. Right now, I'm going to ask the men to come and lead us in prayer. And Brother Greer, I believe, and Brother Wells, I think Brother McCollum. Uh, you'll take this microphone, Brother McCollum, Brother Wells, this one here, Brother Greer over here. These men are going to lead us in prayer tonight. And as they lead us in prayer, I'm going to ask that you take the area that you know you need victory in and bring that to the Lord in prayer. But before you bring that request, I want to ask you this. Would you make sure you're not regarding iniquity in your heart? Would you just say, Lord, if there's anything in my life that needs to be confessed, as these deacons pray tonight, I want to be right with you. And so let's all now join together in prayer. You pray for victory. I'm praying for victory. Let's prepare our hearts even as they begin to pray with confession and repentance. And Brother McCollum, you lead us, then Brother Wells, then Brother Greer. And let's all pray together tonight. Holy Spirit that you've given us to guide us, the Word of God, who leads us in truth. Lord, we pray for our church family. I pray, God, for the needs in this building tonight. Lord, there's no way that pastor or any of us could know each heart, but God, you do. Each burden, but God, you do. And so, Lord, I pray, Father, in a special way tonight that you'd show yourself strong in many of these areas, in the hearts and lives of our church family. Lord, whether it's a physical burden or a financial need or a relationship need or whatever the case might be, Lord, give victory in those areas. Help us to get serious about prayer. Help us to make prayer without ceasing throughout the day, not just at dinner time, not just at bedtime, but throughout the day seeking your face and desiring your will to be accomplished in our hearts and our lives. And Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise for it all because we know without you, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for the, the reminder tonight of the, the formula for victory that our pastor gave us tonight. Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would search each of our hearts, Lord, and we're thankful that you won't forsake those that seek you, Lord. I pray that as we think of the upcoming days in our church schedule, Lord, I think of the uh, leadership conference, Lord, just a few days away, uh, Lord, that you would bless that in a mighty way, that you'd, you'd give safety to those that are coming, Lord, that you'd allow us as a church family to minister the, to those that are going to need encouragement, Lord, but speak to our hearts as well. Lord, may we, may we come with a, a, a hunger, Lord, to, to be changed. Lord, we think of uh, so many aspects of uh, our nation right now and, the, and the, the shape that it's in, Lord, and I pray, Father, that you would just bring revival to our leaders, not only here in California, Lord, but in, but in uh, D.C. We pray, Father, that you would uh, soften hearts, Lord, towards you. Father, we think of the needs, the many needs of the members of our church family, those that are battling cancer, Lord, those that are sick, and Father, you know those needs. We just, I ask you, Lord, that you would do a mighty work, that you'd bring healing, Lord, if it would be your will. Father, we think of our pastor, that you'd help him and give him the strength and stamina that he's going to need as he leads us through this leadership conference shortly, Lord. I pray, Father, for his health, that you'd uh, watch over him and his family. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to have a tender heart towards you. May we love you, Lord. May we seek your face early. And we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for being a great and a wonderful God. 
for being a great and wonderful Savior. Thank you, dear God, for loving us unconditionally. Thank you, Lord, for supplying all of our needs. And Lord, you even give us many of the desires of our heart. Thank you so much for your holy word, Lord, the scriptures that are truth and that are unchanging. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that desires to guide and direct us. And I just pray, God, that we would have open and receptive hearts, Lord, that we would spend time daily in fellowship with you, getting to know you, in fellowship in your word, Lord, allowing your word to mold us, to shape us, that it would affect our actions and our attitudes and our decision making. Lord, that we would develop a biblical worldview, that we would view our reality through the lens of scripture. Mm. Lord, that we would accept your truth as truth and not the truth that the world is presenting. Lord, uh, we thank you that you are faithful and that we can trust you. And I just pray, God, that we would come to you with all of our burdens. We would come to you for all of our needs. We would come to you, Lord, for the joys that we have as well. I just pray, God, that we would have a growing, thriving relationship with you, a personal, intimate relationship with you, Lord, for without you, we can do nothing. Help us to understand that and to recognize that. Help us, Lord, to make a difference in this world by being different. Help us to live for you on purpose, Lord, that our decisions will reflect your love, your life, your word in us. I just pray, God, that you would build a hedge of protection about our church family. I pray, Lord, you would be with our pastor, give him wisdom, Lord, give him strength. Lord, I pray for the health of our church family. I pray, God, that you would protect us from the enemy, from evil. Help us, Lord, by giving us wisdom and discernment, Lord, to be able to avoid the traps and the snares of the enemy. Help us, Lord, to hold fast to our profession of faith and allow you to guide and direct our path. I pray, Lord, for the upcoming uh, spiritual leadership conference that you will work mightily in our hearts and our lives, that we will be prepared, Lord, that we would allow your spirit to live in us, Lord, as we go out into the community, that they would see Jesus in us and that we would let your light shine in us for that is what will make a difference in this world. Thank you so much, God, for your love for us. Thank you so much for your many wonderful blessings to us. And I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, we are in awe at your grace and we are overwhelmed by your attributes. We thank you for your extension of love, especially through the cross, especially through the blood that was shed. And Lord, we do confess to you that at times we can harbor iniquity, uh, bitterness, we can, we can carry things that we didn't even know we were carrying. And I pray tonight that you would reveal those to us and that we would drop the sin and the weight that does so easily beset us. Help us not to regard iniquity in our heart, Lord. Help us to have an abiding relationship with you that we can enter boldly any time. Now, Lord, you know the areas of victory that hundreds of people in this room thought about a moment or two ago. There's something where they need your intervention. And I pray for them, as well as for myself, that you would give victory that only would come from your mighty hand. Father, we pray this according to your will we ask this in faith believing on behalf of those who at this moment have something that they're asking you to give victory in. Now, Father, we pray tonight that you would help us as a church, help us to be a church walking in your spirit and trusting in you every step of the way. And Lord, I want to pray tonight, especially for those in our church that have some special needs, Brother Ron Campbell, who has uh, some uh, heart treatments coming up later this week uh, for Brother Michael. Michael, Lord, with his chemotherapy, 
Father, that you would touch these men and intervene on their behalves and bring healing and strength, hope and patience. Father, there are many others, and we ask that you would give them the strength and healing that comes from your hand. Father, I want to pray for this Sunday. I pray that every member of this church would remember that our connection groups are back on Sunday, that they'd remember the new times of the services, and that Sunday would just be a great day in your house. And then 10 days from now, as we begin the Spiritual Leadership Conference, that you would touch and anoint the meeting for my life, for the life of the church, that we would see you do a great and mighty work, Father, that there would be revival beginning in this place. And Lord, we do want to pray tonight for our missionaries, again in Sri Lanka, but around the world, that you would meet their needs. Bless Brother Rick Martin and especially his wife, Becky, as she's battling cancer as well. We also pray for Dr. R.B. Willett, Lord, as he's having chemo. Lord, would you heal these choice servants of yours and continue using them for your glory. Father, we pray for the ladies' conference this Friday and Saturday. And Lord, we know the ladies uh, are looking forward to it. And I pray that you would bless them through the singing and teaching of your word. May it be a wonderful, wonderful time. And then, Lord, may we take this message with us. And before we partake of the Lord's table Sunday night, I pray that you would bring to mind anything that you want us to deal with in the way of confession and repentance. And Lord, we'll thank you for bringing those things to our mind as we pray it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.